about the hyperobject. They tell secrets. Why does the rain lie about the hyperobject while telling secrets about it? Things get stranger still when we consider a single object, which is why reckoning hyperobjects as a mode of objective presence is simply out of the question. Let us imagine, for the sake of argument, one single thing alone. I know how hard this is for us to do in an age in which even Chevron tells us every day that everything is interconnected. <laughs> one single banker's lamp. The banker's lamp delivers itself. The delivery is different from the deliverer. It is like the difference between the I that is writing this and the I about which I am writing. So that I can say the following sentence. I am lying. I am lying. This sentence is false. Such sentences are liars, the most famous of which is the Cretan uh, liar paradox. All Cretans are liars, says a Cretan. The Cretan is telling the truth and lying at the same time and for the same reasons. The sentence is a hypocrite. It says one thing and does another. Objects are hypocrites, actors portraying themselves. They can't be justly represented. They emit blue notes that differ from themselves without difference. They lie. That quotation again. If you please, Mr. Lacan. What constitutes pretense is that, in the end, you don't know whether it's pretense or not. Hyperobjects simply allow us to see this intrinsic ontological level of hypocrisy because they are just so much larger in scale than we are, both temporally and spatially. We see indexical signs everywhere, but not the hyperobjects as such. We see signs of doom, but the doom is nowhere objectively present. How easy it is for denialism to work its magic on Americans, who are both very insecure and very nihilistic. Gerard Manley Hopkins writes about delivery. Each single thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that being each one indoors dwells. Sells. Goes itself, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. The richly knotted vocabulary hides and tells the truth at the same time. Deals out, delivers. That being indoors, each one dwells. Dwells here seems almost transitive. The thing dwells a secret, being indoors. Dealing it out, pronouncing its doom, delivering it, telling the secret, hypocrisis. Selves, goes itself like going green, going berserk. This scholastic hyketas, or thisness, appears to be simply a vivid version of the standard ontology, actuality, bland substance, unless we recall that objects are hypocrites. How can you go yourself? You are already yourself. You can only go yourself if you are not yourself. You must be not yourself at the same time as being yourself. This is eating away a little bit at the law of non-contradiction. Luckily, it's never been proved. When a thing cries, what I do is me, the thing is saying, this sentence is false. I am lying. The piercing blue note that the object sends out is both major and minor, a perfect photograph and an opaque mask, a femme fatale behind whose eyes is a depth of mystery, or is it a blank void, or not even nothing? Doom. The hyperobject is a liar. We never see the hyperobject directly. We infer it from graphs, instruments, tracks in a cloud diffusion chamber, sunburn, radiation sickness, mutagenic effects, childbirth. We see the shadows of the hyperobject, gigantic patches of darkness that fleetingly wipe across the landscape. We see shadows of humans engraved on a Japanese um, steps. We see rain clouds, mushroom clouds. We see the Oort cloud at the edge of the solar system, the awful shadow of some unseen power. We see figments and fragments of doom. This is the deep reason why inside the hyperobject we are always in the wrong. Since we never encounter the hyperobject directly, since we are the lower dimensional than it and exist with it in an interobjective aesthetic causal space that includes one plus n withdrawn entities, we are unable to get a purchase on them. Hyperobjects stick to us like melting mirrors. They leak everywhere. They undulate back and forth, oozing space time all around them. They come in and out of phase with our quotidian existence. They interface with us in a slightly evil seeming aesthetic dimension. This is why we are in a state of hypocrisy with regard to hyperobjects, why the hypocrisy fish eats the cynicism fish, just as the Darwin fish eats the Jesus fish on the back of some people's cars. <laughs> the game of modernity is such that he, she who grabs the most cynical meta position is the winner. Anything you can do, I can do meta. I am smarter than you because I can see through you. You are smarter than me because you ground your statements by statements in conditions of possibility. From a height, I look down on the poor fools who believe what they think. But it is I who believe more than them. I believe in my distance. I believe in the poor fools. I believe they are deluded. I have a belief about belief. I believe that belief means gripping something as tightly as possible with my mind. Cynicism becomes the default mode of philosophy and of ideology. 
Unlike the poor fool, I am undeluded. Either I truly believe that I have existed, exited from delusion, or I know that no one can, including myself, and I take pride in this disillusionment. This is the attitude that is directly responsible for the ecological emergency. Not the corporation or the individual per se, but the attitude that inheres both in the corporation and in the individual, and in the critique of the corporation and of the individual. Philosophy is directly embodied in the size and shape of a paving stone, the way a Coca-Cola bottle feels to the back of my neck, the design of an aircraft, a system of voting. The overall guiding view has involved a kind of cynical distance. It is logical to suppose that many things in my world have been affected by it. The way a shopping bag looks, the range of options on the sports channel, the way I think nature is over yonder. By thinking rightness and truth as the highest possible elevation, as cynical transcendence, I think the earth and its biosphere as the stage set on which I prance for the amusement of my audience. Indeed, cynicism has already been named in some forms of ideology critique as a default mode of contemporary ideology. But as we have seen, cynicism is only hypocritical hypocrisy. Cynicism is all over the map. Left, right, green, indifferent. Isn't Guy and Holism a form of cynicism? Am I wearing my bulletproof? <laughs> One common Gaian assertion is that there is something wrong with humans. Non-humans are more natural. Humans have deviated from the path and will be wiped out, poor fools. No one says the same about dolphins, but it's just as true. If dolphins go extinct, why worry? Dolphins will be replaced. The parts are greater, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. A mouse is not a mouse if it is not in the network of Gaia. The parts are replaceable. Gaia will replace humans with a less defective component. We're living in a gigantic machine. A very leafy one, perhaps, with a lot of fractals and emergent properties to give it a suitably cool yet non-threatening modern aesthetic feel. A kind of cynicism is enabled by the left. Since no one person's action will solve global warming, better to do nothing or at most await the revolution to come. As I've argued, Vegetarians, Prius owners, and solar power enthusiasts often encounter this sort of logic. The trouble is, left cynicism maps perfectly onto US Republican do nothing ism and onto Gaian defeatism. Gaia will replace us like a defective component. Nothing happens. Result global warming continues apace. A certain Nietzschean tendency is at work, striving for being meta than now. Cynicism is nothing other than the attitude inherent in what Heidegger calls the onto theological stance of this Nietzscheanism, pure becoming floating in the void. Holding reality at a distance, it reifies reality into an objectively present block, um, then explodes the block itself. No longer serving the purpose for which it was intended, Marxian critique becomes just a specific mode of this Nietzschean tendency. To assert this is by no means to suggest that there is no social reality beyond capitalism, yet this critique mode is not attuned to the time of hyperobjects which brings cynicism to an end. The Romantic period was the beginning of the phase in which cynicism became the highest mode of thinking. Romantic period art writes the manual on how to produce avant-garde products starting an inflationary war in which successive ways of the avant-garde strive to overmaster their predecessors. This movement is deeply akin to the way in which philosophy gradually retreated into the possibility of the possibility of the possibility of gradually eroding its ability to talk about reality, a self-inflicted wound of doubt and paranoia. Yet the Romantic period was also the moment at which non-human beings emerged decisively on the human stage. Animal rights became thinkable, not simply as a mystical practice, but as a political one. Carbon began to spread around Earth, eventually ending up in the ice flows of the Arctic. Hegel says that the owl of Minerva, the forward movement of history, which just is the progress of thinking, flies only at dusk. Perhaps it is better to think of the owl of Minerva as the oil of Minerva. The counter-narrative of the Romantic period and beyond is the story of how the oil of Minerva gradually convinces cynicism that it is only a disguised form of hypocrisy. It is to this story that we now turn, the story of non-humans finally convinced the most recalcitrant humans to let them into their thinking. This is the story of how we arrived at the next moment of history, not by dint of our own efforts, but because the very inner logic of science ran up against a limit, revealing the uncanny futurality of all objects to see. The, owl, the oil of Minerva, the owl of Minerva was discovered to be coated in oil.